This morning, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Barbara Hahn, um, who is a disease ecologist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Um, prior to her time at the Cary Institute, Dr. Hahn completed consecutive NSF and NIH postdoc fellowships at the University of Georgia, um, one with Dr. Sonia Altizer, Altizer and one with Dr. John Drake. Um, who many of you may remember from his, his presentation here. Um, and her research really is at the intersection of ecology, computing, and global health. Um, and um, she uses cutting edge machine learning techniques to forecast outbreaks of new uh, zoonotic diseases at the human wildlife interface. Um, she does this um, really by trying to predict um, what animal species um, might become potential um, disease carriers uh, that we may not know about, and also where and when diseases might be likely to emerge. Um, we're really excited to have her here uh, today to tell us about her work understanding beta coronavirus risk in mammals. Thank you so much, Spencer, for that introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. I don't um, I interact a lot with global health folks, of course, especially with respect to COVID stuff, but um, the work that I do is really very animal and ecology based. Um, and I like to think about, I mean, you mentioned forecasting, which I think about very differently than the kinds of forecasting that you all do um, and folks like Jeff Shaman and John Drake do. Um, the kinds of predictions or forecasts that we think about are um, how uh, animal species and vector species and even pathogen types um, uh, are, their, what, how their likelihood of being zoonotic or um, seeding a spillover event, for example, are informed by ecological patterns and dynamics, um, especially like natural history characteristics, um, just traits about how traits that describe how they are persisting in the environment and contending with, um, you know, selective forces that they're experiencing all the time. Um, so when I got the invitation um, from Spencer, it sounded like um, a really a really great group, um, but also I wasn't sure. Um, I guess how much ecology folks have had. So um, if you have any questions as I go through some slides that I've thrown together here, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Uh, Are you guys seeing presenter view or regular view? Uh, not seeing anything. Oh. Um. Okay. How about now? We see the presenter view now. Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, yep, that's is right. that working? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, these are uh, these are slides that describe some work that we um, just finished up. We're we're still thinking through some of the results. It, it, it's posted on BioArchive. Um, but it's this project that tries to understand what whether we can predict. Um, you know, zoonotic capacity of, zoonot of animal species. And we're really focusing in on the mammals just due to data limitations. Um, but when I use the term zoonotic capacity, I really mean two things. One is susceptibility, which is sort of a necessary condition for an animal to be able to transmit infection forward, which is really the thing that we're interested in predicting. Um, and, the, and the motivation for this, of course, is um, because we know that animals get a uh, sp secondary spillback infection or a spill uh, spillback infection from humans. Um, and some of these animals are, you know, zoo animals like we've seen in the news and, um, you know, of conservation concern. Um, and others are quite domestic and in close contact with humans. And so there's this um, possibly, I think, still pretty small chance that, um, that the spillover events could continue to occur in sort of a long tail um, of infection as we move into and through this pandemic into the future. Um, so we wanted to see what data were available to help um, inform this question. And we, I mean, to be quite honest with you, I did not think that we were gonna get anywhere because there are just so few data available for species that have even tested positive, let alone been confirmed as capable of transmitting infection forward. So um, we got started. Um, this was a, a collaboration um, with two of the postdocs in my lab, 
Adrian and Ilya, um, and a virologist at Arizona State named Arvind Varsani, and a structural biologist at Stanford University. Uh, actually, I think Joao has recently taken a position in industry. Um, so the, <clears throat> this is the team that um, worked really hard to try to um, pull this off. And it was, it was a really awesome learning process because I am not, um, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a virologist in this in a way that Arvind is, and I'm not a structural biologist by any stretch. So it was a truly collaborative exercise that I think we all learned a lot from. Um, so the, the, the way that we started thinking about the problem was to think about how the virus would get into a cell. Um, because that, that's the most information that we have and um, it seemed like a reasonable starting point. So we read a whole bunch about ACE2 um, and about, so ACE2 is a receptor that um, is highly conserved across vertebrates. Um, I think it spans like, uh, it, it was just, it was kind of astronomical actually when we looked at the spread, the taxonomic spread of ACE2, it's basically in all chordates, across all chordates. So it's a highly conserved receptor that has a lot to do with regulating blood pressure um, and other regulating other metabolic activities. Um, ACE2 binds with the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So I'm sort of cheating here and showing a figure that I thought was really nice and clear from a previous paper that is on SARS-1, not on SARS-2. Um, but I think the general concept is there. So we're looking at the 3D structural binding. Um, and this is a step forward from sort of sequence comparisons where um, everything's one, you know, 1D or just kind of uh, matching up sequences. And it's even a little bit different from the 2D modeling where you're trying to figure out where things are touching each other. This um, structural modeling takes into account all of those, um, that all of that information, but also uh, models the, uh, the weak forces and the strong forces that regulate that binding and the plasticity and variation therein. So it's really taking advantage of a bunch of different structural elements um, that are present in these, uh, in, in eight, both ACE2 and in the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. Um, so when we think about the data availability for, um, for, for, this, for this binding exercise, right? So we're, the, um, the consensus is that the stronger ACE2 binds with the receptor binding domain, the more likely it is that the virus will be able to get into the cell and then all of those downstream activities that have to occur in order for the species to shed virus um, are more, more likely to happen. Um, however, we are really limited in the number of ACE2 orthologs that are available that are published. So um, uh, this is like a fundamental problem, right? We don't have a lot of information about what species carry, uh, can carry SARS-CoV-2 or even test positive for it. And we have very little information about species ACE2 and therefore their ability to find this virus. So in order to address this, we, um, we thought through a modeling framework that we thought would work. So we're kind of bridging across multiple modeling methods in order to try to bring some inference to this problem. So this is kind of a busy slide, but I think it sets up what we tried to do here. So I'm gonna to try to walk you through it. Um, so we start by gathering, can you guys see my, my uh, mouse when I move it? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we start by you know, gathering the field and the lab evidence for what hosts have been confirmed and, and predicted um, based on like laboratory experiments or, or um, sorry, the, the structural modeling that other people, folks have done computational modeling. And we, you know, we have a list of those species. Um, but uh, we try to augment that with the ACE2 sequences that have been collected for species. So these are things that have been published in GenBank. Um, uh, we have a lot of sequences for fish, um, oddly enough. And um, I mean, birds, reptiles, mammals, et cetera. So there's tons of species and um, there's a widespread of species, although there's not that many sequences. Um, so we combine the sequences with, we model the, the way that the, um, the structure is fit together and the strength of that binding using the structural modeling technique. Um, it's called, the software is called Haddock. Uh, so we take these Haddock scores, which are just an estimate of, of binding strength. And we try, to, um, we try to predict the binding strength from the model using trait data. Um, of the species. So I'll get into what trait data I'm talking about later, but they're essentially these characteristics that I mentioned in my intro, just things that describe how an organism um, relates to its environment and persists in the wild. So, um, and we use machine learning to do that step here, this second step. Um, when we do that, um, we have to set, we have to make decisions about how to treat binding strength. It is um, sort of a continuous variable in a sense, although there are limits, but 
Um, we decided to threshold it just to be pretty conservative. And I can explain the thresholding on, I think the next slide. Um, once we do that, the model is then able to um, assign these species into categories. So essentially a zero or a one, um, which and, and a probability, an estimated probability of its risk of, you know, binding, some, binding um, the RBD strongly. Um, once we get this estimate of probability or this classification for zoonotic risk, we can then compare those predictions to um, what we, so we compare the predictions to what we have already gathered um, or have been confirmed from the field and from the lab. Um, and we, we like, so there's, there's this sort of meeting in the middle I'm having trouble describing. There's a bunch of lab work and field work going on, people trying to figure out what can get infected by SARS-CoV-2. And then there's a bunch of computational predictions going on. And some of those computational predictions don't match what's seen in the field um, or in the lab. And um, so we try to make sense of all of that by um, making predictions using this other method and making sure that, that the predictions that we've made match up with what's been found in the lab, match up what's been found in the field, and also um, identify some species that we think should be watched or surveilled, or at least, um, you know, we should be aware of them. So this is the pipeline that we employed. Um, when we did this first step of haddock modeling, we used all of the sequences that we had available. Um, so that spanned uh, there we go, all, um, <clears throat> let's see, six different classes of organisms. Um, I think there were around 400, a little less than four. I think we had to throw out a bunch of sequences because they weren't quite long enough or um, high enough quality. So I think there are about 360 species maybe represented on this graph. Um, but this just, so the gray area is um, strong binding, what, what we're considering to be strong. We sort of drew this threshold cutoff at cats domestic cats. Above the cats, um, we see that binding is strong enough to, so this, this cats are the species that binds SARS-CoV-2 the weakest, but also still showing evidence of transmission, of viral shedding. Um, and so we drew the threshold at, at the cats and, and just said everything that's strong, strong, binding more strongly than cats, we're going to consider to be a one, and everything below that is a zero. Um, and uh, there's, yeah, so the diversity here was pretty staggering, although unfortunately we couldn't, we couldn't use a lot of this information because um, the traits that distinguish these classes from each other are really hard to compare. So the things that people measure to try to understand fish, actinopterygii, and the chondrichthys, they're, I mean, they're just measuring completely different things. These are animals that live in the water. They have a totally different life history. Um, so the features that we had collected to try to make inferences across the, these groups um, it didn't make sense. Um, and in addition to that, the species that we as humans seem to be most concerned by right now, just because of the pathway of transmission, um, seem to be mammals, in particular mammals that we're in closer contact with. Um, so we really subsetted the uh, analysis to mammals at this point, but I'll just walk you through what, um, so if you just zoom in on this mammal bar here, um, it looks like actually that the ray fin fishes, the actinopterygii, bind quite strongly, although I don't think that I don't really know what to make that, to be honest. I mean, I don't I don't think that transmission of SARS-CoV-2 to fish or from fish is really a problem, although I, I could be wrong. Um, same with birds. We had some birds that were strongly binding, although I, I didn't, uh, we didn't really get into the detail, details in that group either. We really focused on the mammals. Um, and then if you break mammals down into their orders, we find that our model, um, basically took all of the primates and put them as, high, as highly, uh, strongly binding, uh, predicted them as strongly binding. There was quite a few rodents that were interesting, some bats and a bunch of carnivores. Um, so <clears throat> for the, the traits that we used you, from these, so we now have haddock scores, which estimate binding strength to SARS-CoV-2. And what we wanna know is whether traits can predict haddock score. So can traits about these, these mammals tell us something about how strongly binding um, they are to SARS-CoV-2. So in order to do that, we had to collect a bunch of trait data. A lot of these data were already collected from previous um, work in our group, and we augmented them with, um, you know, newer data sets that are uh, repositories online. And then we engineered a couple of additional features that based on previous study um, suggest, were, were suggested to be kind of important for predicting zoonotic status. Um, so this is, 
not all of the features, but um, just to give you a sense for the kinds of information that are available that we typically draw from. Um, and I think that these data are really interesting and powerful for helping us to understand the process, like the sort of the, um, I, I don't want to say mechanism, but, uh, you know, helping us to understand the why, uh, why, why certain animals are able to um, act as reservoirs um, differently from the many species that, that don't seem to have this capacity. Um, and it's, it's really giving us this sort of multidimensional snapshot of each species and their uh, place in the world and how they contend with these selection pressures. Um, and they're also less biased. The trait data are a little bit less biased in the sense that, that they're not over-representing species that are distributed in rich countries, for example. Um, and they offer us a snapshot into this like long evolutionary history that you otherwise really wouldn't have a sense for um, without uh, very specific viral host interaction studies. So we took all of these data um, and we used this machine learning method to um, predict binding strength using these traits, just to see if it would work and how well it would work. Um, so when we did that, we, we were kind of surprised by the results. So it worked. Um, it worked with about 74% accuracy. So what that means is that the model using information provided by the traits was able to classify accurately 74% of the time zeros versus ones. So remember that that zero versus one is a cutoff that we set. So there is some, you know, if you move the threshold lower, it does better. If you move it up, it does worse. So this is sort of an art, but um, it performed pretty well. I think that depending on how you run the numbers, you can get it to go up to 80% accuracy. Um, so we played around for probably far too long with this model and convinced ourselves that it's actually doing what we think it's doing. Um, it predicted several uh, groups of mammals to be, to contain species that are really important. Um, I mean, I'm just giving a list of those major groups again here for the bats there were many teropis, which are the fruit bat uh, genus that were predicted to have um, a high estimated risk. Some of the rhinolophids, which um, are, you know, ha harboring the SARS-CoV-2 sequences that are the most closely related to the circulating human strain. Um, and then there are these other species of interest, right? Pangolins for obvious reasons, and then tree shrews, which are actually very widely distributed in some regions and also used as a model, model species, um, like a, a lab organism. And they're trying to develop some of the other uh, subspecies into lab organisms as well for various pathogens of human concern. Um, so uh, I'm going to just walk through. So I thought, <laughs> Rob, there's a lot of species that I could go through and talk about here in our paper, probably not so well. Does did we try to like separate out the groups of species by why we should care about them? So we talked about animals that are domesticated. We talked about animals that are of conservation concern because we're actively managing this population. So humans are going in and taking care of these animals and interact and collecting data from them. For example, wildlife biologists. Um, so we do that in the paper, but I thought that I would just go through some of the, 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 high, the highest risk ones that were predicted by a model that occur in Texas. So I have a couple of slides for the Texas species that we can walk through. Um, I thought the coolest result, well, one of the coolest results, and I guess it's not cool depending on how you think about it, um, is it's not great news, but the white-footed mouse and the deer mouse had among the highest estimated probabilities produced by our model. And this was before the preprints came out, which showed experimental evidence of transmission from species from one animal to another. So the Griffin et al. paper demonstrated this for Paramiscus leucopus and uh, Fager, Anna Fager and, and her group demonstrated this for the deer mouse. Um, so the fact that they were able, so they characterized, it was more of a virological study where they were trying to understand how the pathogenesis happened, where the infections were localized, um, you know, what the tropisms were and how they were shedding. Um, and then they did the transmission experiment to see if they actually did shed from mouse to mouse. And in both cases, they found evidence that that occurred. Um, so that we thought was, um, it was heartening because we thought, okay, we're getting something right. The, all of the COVID literature as it's coming out, we're kind of constantly like sampling from it to see if there's any additional information that we can add into the model to make it more accurate, but also checking to make sure that the predictions that the model has already made are actually like holding water and, and standing up to empirical evidence. Um, some other species that are, I had actually never heard of, I don't even think I'm saying it right, Nilgali, is that how you got, is that how it said? Apparently they're hunted in Texas. Um, 
that species was, uh, I guess it's ranched also in South Texas, in parts of South Texas. So um, that species was high, uh, had a high estimated risk score. White-tailed deer, um, which was, which was surprising um, and, and possibly concerning because it has such a wide geographic range. Um, it's there, they are farmed in some places. They are hunted pretty much everywhere across its range. And sometimes they can occur in quite high densities. Again, it's not clear how, um, you know, none of these analyses that I'm presenting today really get into the details about behavioral dynamics. It's not like we're walking up to deer and snuggling them. So, you know, the risk of spillover transmission from a human to an animal might be quite low. Um, and then the risk of a transmission event from the animal back to the human might also be quite low, but given the very long tail that we estimate will happen into the foreseeable future, this is probably not something that we should ignore. Um, so white-tailed deer, Nigali, bison, um, pronghorn, black bear. Um, apparently this cougar was shot somewhere south of San Antonio. Um, and they're all hunting pictures. So when I typed in the species names and typed in Texas, like I got just a ton of hunting. So I'm not picking on hunters, just to be clear, there's hunters in this group. Um, but I guess hunting is a big deal in Texas and many of the species that were high up on our list happen to be species that are hunted. So um, I listed these here. Uh, yeah, so not to freak you guys out or anything, but this is just, I thought I'd make it relevant for this crowd. Um, there are also some species, like I mentioned, that were of conservation concern. The Eastern Gorilla, um, so the Eastern Gorilla was predicted to be pretty high up on our list and it's um, closely related species which are found in the zoos here have already been confirmed. And, um, you know, we're still trying to look into this with our model, but our model um, predicted pretty much all of the primates um, to, to have a high risk. And we think that's because of um, evolutionary, evolutionary, the small evolutionary distance between humans and primates. So that kind of makes sense, but um, uh, it also appears that the catarine primates are the ones that are sort of old world primates are um, had generally higher risk scores than the than the other types of primates. Um, there's a horseshoe bat that was of interest, and the common tree shoe I think I already mentioned as being of interest because of its density and its interest as a lab species. Um, so I alluded to this before, but transmission really requires contact, right? Especially for a pathogen like this, where it's, it's, it's given its transmission mode. Um, so the groups that we sort of focus on in our paper and we think are, uh, should be focused on in terms of like a human management for the long term are, are domesticated species. So I haven't talked about mink at all, but um, the mink are really concerning because they're they're still farmed. They're, the farms in the United States haven't been shut down. And actually, um, they're not required to report any of the outbreaks that may or may not occur on their farms. So if they have a bunch of mink that are dying off, they're actually not required by law to report that, at least the last I heard. Um, and so, and the other interesting thing about the mink story is that the way that they're fed is by dropping a pellet of food uh, on the top of each of the cages. And it's not like a human goes in and interacts with the animal and feeds them. Um, they use sort of an automated machine to shoot the food onto each of the cages. So um, the content, and, and during the middle of the pandemic, there were not a lot of workers on the farms. There was like one, uh, one person, at least on this one farm that, that a journalist was really looking into on this one farm that she um, interviewed for, interviewed with, there was one guy who went in and fed and he was doing it using a machine. So, um, but this is the place where the variant that was found in the mink was also then found to spill back again into humans. And then you can do the epidemiology to like figure out which groups were located close to particular farms, which had the mink variant that those people had. So the connection between the animal spillover and spillback and human infection is pretty clearly established for the mink across the world now. But um, so it, it sort of provides this one end of a cautionary tale. But on the other side, it's like, there's all of these species that I can't really imagine how the transmission event would happen with humans. Although I guess if you roll the dice enough times, it's likely to happen, especially for things like rodents that get into your house. Um, so the other interesting thing about the mink that I'll mention just real quick is that um, mink, because of the uh, the composition of the food that they're given. Mink farms end up attracting a lot of cats, feral cats, um, which 
uh, I've already told you uh, why we selected them as the threshold, but they get infected. Um, so it could be that there's a cat to mink back and forth transmission there. And then it could be a cat to human transmission cycle that's happening rather than a mink to human. Um, I think the jury is still out and I'm actually not sure who's working on it or, or digging into that further because I think the data are being held quite close to the chest there. Um, <clears throat> so there's some interesting dynamics still to be unpacked um, for the spillover transmission cycles in, in wildlife. The other thing that we really wanted to do was place this in context. So this is just a map showing geographic distributions for the top 10% um, uh, probabilities for all of the animals that we predicted. Um, and you can sort of see that they're geographically widely distributed, um, but really we wanted to subset these down um, to the kinds of habitat. So this is um, subset by habitat use. Like if an animal is only ever located, um, if it can't persist in places where humans are, then we sort of excluded it because the transmission risk there would be quite low. Um, and then we subset it further by just the species that overlap with COVID-19 like hotspots in people. So places where there's a lot of infected people and these animals exist and they seem, seem to do fine in human commensal habitats. Um, this is the map, that's the map that I'm showing you here. Um, so there's, a. will stack them here just to show you the, the breakdown, but um, if we wanted to make some decisions about if we had resources to, to do more surveillance about animals that could be either sentinels or potential reservoirs for long-term COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the wild, then um, possibly these locations here on the bottom map would be the place to start. And starting from the species that have the highest risk of overlapping with humans just based on our relationships with them. Um, I have acquired a lot of opinions about, <laughs> about data limitations and about how to cross-validate and how to make sure that these um, predictions are useful and believable. Um, I think one of the things that has convinced me about that this project has convinced me about is the need for this iterative loop between um, models that are built using data that are immediately available, data that are um, sometimes really sparse, um, but being able to generate a first pass prediction to the highest uh, accuracy that you can. And then, you know, either watching the literature or um, actually making those predictions actionable and going out and filling in blanks so that the answers that you get wrong and the answers that are confirmed can, can fold back into the model and, and sort of strengthen the whole process. I don't, and lab experiments um, also should be part of that process. So if we're making a pretty strong prediction that a particular species that has a high potential to transmit to humans just based on its biology, um, that species should be taken into the lab and either pseudotype virus testing then to be done on it or, or in vivo testing. Um, so, you know, those are some of the, oh, this is a, the wrong slide for, uh, but it's, it's fine. Um, list some of my collaborators, but I think that um, this, Part of the, uh, the other thing that this um, project highlighted for me was that uh, there, there are these sort of big gaps, I feel like, in connecting between disciplines. So when you read papers that have, um, that are really sort of in the details about viral binding and cell entry, um, they talk a lot about the protease environment. So even the experiments that are done, you have to like do a protease wash on the cells in order for the, the process to work and the cell to get in. But of course the protease environment for all of these species are likely to be really different. Um, and it's the protease information um, is definitely not there yet for us to be able to incorporate it. Um, what we have are ACE sequences, ACE2 sequences, and that's what we're going on. Um, it's really surprising to me that the traits were able to predict ACE2 binding to SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domains so well, but 74% is not awesome. <laughs> it's better than like 50%. Um, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity to ingest other kinds of data into this approach um, and make the results um, richer for folks who are trying to set up lab experiments, trying to do field surveillance, or trying to understand the process in general. Um, that's all I had for you. I wonder if folks have questions. Um, nobody interrupted me, so maybe I talked a little fast. 